so uh, my name is uh, Ruth Lewert. Uh, I um, graduated uh, from college in 1953, and before I graduated, I went for an, I was in New York City, and I just dropped in at IBM headquarters there for an interview, and uh, the interviewer kept talking about programming. Every third word was programming, and he gave me a magazine on programming, and I'm sitting there realizing that I don't know a thing. I have no idea what programming is. And <laughs> here I can have a math degree from a prestigious school, and I don't know what programming is. That's, that was just the state of the art at that time. People didn't know. And so I was quite nervous. Uh, but it didn't seem to faze him that I knew nothing about programming. And he sent for my papers and got them and read them and quite unexpectedly offered me a job on the spot at IBM. Well, I didn't go to IBM. In the end, I went to Bell Labs. I don't remember exactly why, but I went to Bell Labs in Whippany, New Jersey. And Whippany, at that time, was the military center for Bell Labs. All the military work was done in Whippany. And it, now I can see that the building is for sale or was sold recently, or some of the buildings anyway. So that's no longer the case. But anyway, I worked at Whippany, New Jersey uh, on military work. And at one point, I was loaned to a department headed by Gene Felker, who uh, who also was responsible for the Tradic computer. He was the, it was the first uh, digital computer. Uh, transistorized. transistorized digital computer. That was the important thing, it was transistorized. Uh, so if you look at this picture, um, it's squished a little bit, but you can just about see. On the floor is Gene Felker, who is working on the plug board. And the plug board is how you gave the computer the instructions. It, not paper, not anything else, but just a plug board. And you had to use these patch cords to go from the um, plug board that you had and connect to the computer itself. And this computer already existed when I arrived. It had already been built, so it was 19, probably around 1954, middle of 1954. And so he's putting a plug board or is putting uh, commands into a plug board. And to the right is Jim Harris, who was his second in command and who was responsible for building Tradic. And he's uh, working with toggle switches, which is how you entered constants. So the constants went into the computer as binary digits, bits, uh, and he's shown with that part. On the left side, at the top, uh, you see an oscilloscope. I think it was a Tektronix oscilloscope, and that was your output device. So all of the output appeared in, I guess, an analog form on the, uh, on the oscilloscope. So you had rather limited means for input, output, and programming. Uh, but And the TRADIC stands for Transistor Digital Computer. Uh, you'll see other definitions for it, other descriptions for it, but that's, that's what Felker used, and if it's good enough for Felker, it's good enough for me, is Transistor Digital Computer. And uh, he convinced, Felker was, had a very convincing manner, so if you knew him, he, he could convince you of almost anything. And he sold the Air Force on the fact that this was would give lower power consumption than, the, than the, the, the technology then in use by the military. And it had a smaller size, you know, transistors, diodes, and all of that, and lower weight, and it was more reliable. And he put a lot of focus on reliability and a lot of testing. And so he convinced the military Air Force to do this, and so this was built in the laboratory. Well, if we're talking about smaller size, take a look at it, and you'll see it's not exactly small size. It's huge. 
but the, the reason it's huge is because they didn't want to take the time to consider miniaturization at this point. They were in a hurry to get this thing moving. So. I guess I should point it over there, maybe. Actually, I see what he's doing. Some of them are on or, no, I'm in the wrong place. I'm in the wrong place. Never mind. see over there. Let me just see what the problem is. We're not getting the next screen. I'll go for you. I'll run it for you. Oh, okay. All right, before I get into the particular area where I was working, I wanted to give you sort of an overview of the whole Tradic project. Uh, the computer you saw was the phase one, the picture you saw it was Tradic phase one, and in 1954 it was installed and working in the lab. It was in this lab in Whippany, uh, and the idea was the f uh, to determine the feasibility of using transistors <coughs> in digital computers that could be used to save uh, to solve aircraft bombing and navigation problems. So immediately you see there's a military application. And that was the original one and it was there for several years. Uh, it was followed by what was called the flyable Tradic. And the flyable tra tra Tradic uh, was to establish the feasibility of using airborne solid state computer as a control element for bombing of navigation systems. And uh, two machines were built uh, for the flyable Tradic. Uh, one for flight testing aboard an Air Force cargo plane, and a second one for the lab debugging in the lab. And uh, R.E. Lane, whom I didn't know, headed this project, and Paul Gilloff was the project engineer. Uh, the third one was Leprechaun, and we'll come to why that name was chosen a little later. Uh, this was the Explore the Capabilities of the New Solid State Devices for Airborne Computers, again. Junction. Uh, yeah, well, it switched to junk. It used junction transistors. The first uh, ones used point contact transistors because they were the ones that people were familiar with at the time, and this one ventured into junction transistors. And uh, originally the effort was led by Gene Felker, uh, but then he went on to something else and Jack Baird uh, came into the picture and then Jim Harris and Jack Giffens. These were all people who were around Whippany at that time. And then the fourth and final one in the Tradic family is this XMH3 computer. Uh, these are all in the same time frame, if you notice. This is 1956 to 1958. And it was intended as a control unit for a bombing and navigation system. Uh, but it was never implemented because uh, the Air Force canceled the, pro uh, the project. So that was the end of that. All right, if I can go to the next one. <laughs> All right, I mentioned the word reliability before, and it was very important. And I will be talking now mostly about the phase one computer, which is the first of the set of four. Uh, the machine operated uh, what we would say 24-7, uh, usually doing error protection uh, detecting programs around the clock. And the half-life estimate uh, that Felker came up with was 70 years per transistor. And what it really means is that it was essentially error-free. That was the estimate was error-free, and I think it didn't have 
a, lot, a high error rate. Uh, and Gene Felker, at one, in a paper that he wrote, said, since we are proud of the machine, we frequently interrupt it to run <coughs> special display programs and sometimes use it to produce useful output results. And apparently that's where I came in, the useful output results, because I don't remember doing much with maintenance, but I do remember uh, writing programs, and I don't think I knew at the time what the program was supposed to do, except I do know it was used for a radar in the Pacific somewhere. So it, I guess it was useful in the end, and I think that's it. Our next piece. All right, here's the phase one program, and from here on for a while we'll be talking only about that phase one computer. And there's the image again, and the first application, uh, when he was touting the reliability of the computer, he said, we're going to give you a computer that is as reliable as a hammer. So that was from me. And the se second application was to be used in a Navy track well scan shipboard radar system, and I really don't know what became of that. Uh, next, please. All right, the modules or the things that uh, the characteristics of the computer would have it had a delay, it could handle delay, active short delay, an integrating AND, and a clock filter. Uh, they used, as I mentioned before, high speed contact switching transistor. Uh, and didn't switch to junction transistors, as I mentioned, until le le Leprechaun. There were eight packages and or inhibit memory. Uh, and I thought there was something else here. Uh, maybe it fell off the screen. Uh, and I have memory highlighted because that was one of the uh, because the memory, or the storage rather, was not done in a conventional way. You didn't have uh, bits that, uh, you had binary digits, 16 of them, uh, but they were built from delay lines. Uh, you had a 16 microsecond long delay line and the 16-bit registers were built from four delay lines, so that's how you handled the memory. And there were 700 point contact, well that's rounded, 700 point contact germanium transistors, 10,000 diodes, 6,000 resistors, and more than 1,000 transformers. So this was the phase one. Next, please. All right, as I, as I pointed out when I showed the picture, you used wired programs that could be changed via the replaceable plug boards as stored programs were too complicated at the time. I mean, I think the, technically they existed, but they were, they considered them too complicated. So they didn't use that. So they used the wired programs, and the plug board was a pleasure to, <laughs> to go in and put the uh, patch cords from one instruction to the next. The, 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 the only memory at the time were delay lines, which uh, delay line would just store 16 bits. Yeah, these delay lines did, yes. And they used 13 top, just imagine, only 13 toggle switches to enter all the content, constants, and uh, then they built modules for specific functions. Uh, there were 18 delay lines used for storage, so you could have 18 inputs. Um, not 18 inputs, you could store 18 things at a time. And magnetic cores didn't yet exist, so. And uh, the only uh, cheating element was the vacuum tubes provided the clock. So that was a non-transistor. And there was some issue about whether that made it a digital computer or not. <laughs> Next, please. All right, the modules plugged into vacuum top tube sockets and uh, Felker had advertised, eventually, he hoped to produce a one cubic foot computer. And as you saw, that computer, at least the one I knew, was certainly not one cubic foot. It was, uh, I don't have the exact size of it, but uh, 
it had quite a, a footprint, uh, dozens of feet, cubic feet. Uh, and reliability, they tested the transistors 24 hours a day. And they said there were people there at night. Uh, I don't recall that, but uh, they said at one point maybe that was. Now, transistors require air conditioning. And Whippany, when I came there, I discovered, had no air conditioning. So here it was in 1953 in a nice hot summer and there was no air conditioning in the building. That came as a shock to me. And, uh, but the lab had air conditioning. So the computers had to be air conditioned. Otherwise, it, they didn't, the computer had to be air conditioned. Otherwise, it didn't work. And so it, they had some failures associated. I remember that one time when the power went out, uh, the, or the air conditioning power went out, then uh, the transistors got into trouble and they had some failures. They had quite a few failures at that time. But generally, not a lot of failures. Uh, they predicted the uh, performance before testing so that they could avoid what they called using an Edisonian approach of random selection where they would just keep tr try everything, test everything, and to see what would fail. Uh, but the idea was to find out what was not going to fail before, and then uh, then do your testing. So the, they would uh, modify the voltage to the transistors, and then see which transistors gave out, and then they would eliminate them from further testing. So that was the idea there. So reliability was occupied as far as I can see for two years that's what they were doing reliability yes. testing and what I was doing was just a sideline really to what was going on if you have any questions you can interrupt uh, programming considerations okay so here I was doing programming and it was a series of 64 steps the whole program had to consist of 64 steps Plus, there was a 64-step subroutine that you could go to. So altogether, you had 128 steps of program available to you. If you compare that with today's <laughs> computers, that's a little ridiculous. And uh, you had to see the operating system was really a set, a set series of these stepping instructions, and you entered these. Each instruction was entered by this patch cord on the plug patch cord on the plug board. Uh, and the output, as I mentioned, was displayed in analog form on a tectronic scope. And now the problem is, what kind of a program can you possibly write that doesn't use more subroutines or that doesn't have available conditional statements? You know, if this, do that, else do this kind of statements. And uh, I found that as a stumbling block because I couldn't see that you could write anything useful if you didn't have conditional statements. No ifs, ands, or buts. Uh, so I must have expressed my concern to Jean Felker, who then came up with this idea. Well, if you can generate a zero and a one, zero if you want to go one place, one if you want to go to the other place, then uh, you, multiply, you multiply the two addresses by the zero and the one and add them. And I'll show, show this as it becomes a little bit clearer. Okay, here are the mi missing conditional instructions and this is what we did. Uh, can you see the individual statements? No, okay. All right, I, I guess I can't do anything about it. Um, yeah, I guess if you zoom in, okay, good. <laughs> All right, step 100, and this is an artificial example, and the whole thing is a little bit different than the actual, but you, just to get the idea of what was doing. So if you were at step 100, you, you computed a variable A, and you made A either 0 or 1. I won't go into the details how you got the 0 and the 1, except uh, that we had a fortuitous uh, thing that the computer had a logic circuit in it that allowed you to do this. This was uh, just a ha happy accident. So I could make a zero or and I could make a one. I don't know that anybody had used the logic uh, circuit for that purpose before. So we've got in step 100, we've got either a zero or a one depending on what you wanted to do next. 
So uh, the next step, uh, 150, is a simple, very simple step. You multiply A by 250, and you multiply not A by 300, and you added the results together. And if you do that, if A is 0, you're going to get 300, because not A is 1. And <coughs> if you if A is 1, you're going to get 250. So the result of step 150 is you can generate the numbers for B. B is now equal to either 250 or 300. And 250 is uh, the beginning of a set of instructions, alternate instructions, uh, one set of instructions. And 300 is the other set of instructions. So in one case, you want to go to 250, and in the other case, you want to go to 300. Is that OK? And at the end of each of these sets, like at 250, the last step is, uh, the last uh, instruction is to jump to 350. And likewise, in the purple section, the last step is jump to 350, although you'll probably get there automatically. So uh, the jump in 200 took you to either the instruction set one or instruction set two, and that's what those two arrows show, one or the other. And in either case, at the end, you went to 350, which is the rest of your program. So that's how you implemented a conditional instruction. And you could have lots of these. There was no limit, except, of course, you only had 64 or 128 steps to work with. But, OK, we're ready for the next one. Uh, these are some basic building blocks, because you don't have integrated circuits. And these are not intended as actual demos of what was used, but just to get the idea across. So the delay line operated. You have a, a bunch of um, bits coming in one at a time. And the delay line would give you the output. The same number would come out that went in, only a little bit later. And then it fed around to the front of the delay line, so it went in again. So it just circulated around. And that's how that's the storage unit. The idea is the storage unit went in and stayed there a few seconds and then came out again. Uh, so that's storage. Uh, the second example is um, a diode. Again, in normal, uh, in later <coughs> systems, you would have an OR gate to do an OR function. But probably at that time, they didn't have OR gates. And I'm guessing that they used something like the uh, diagram on the left. I really don't know. So you have an input A, and you have an input B. And the out is the OR. So if either A or B were one, you would get one out. But if they were both zero, then you got zero out. And you can see that in the, in the table to the right. So that was sort of a, the basis of an OR gate. And it may not resemble anything like they use, but the idea is there. OK, the next, please. All right, here's the origin going, going back a little bit of time. Uh, there were a lot of high speed. Um, a lot of uh, units, little modules that were built, and Felker put them all together in a multiplier circuit. And this is the multiplier circuit and its control unit shown on the right. It isn't a great photo. It's the best one I could find. But uh, that was the package. The package had, uh, and you can just make out that there are a lot of individual packages there, <coughs> modules there. And so the multiplier included things like ANDs and uh, other units, other blocks that they needed, modules that they needed. And he took this into the Air Force and showed them that with this he could build a computer. And I guess this is what led one reason that he got the contract for the Tratic, to build the Tratic. They were impressed by this transistorized thing. OK, now I know those of you in the back cannot see this because it's a table I took from one of the papers by, um, by Murray Irvin, 
who worked uh, in he worked with the Whippany people. I'm not sure he was in Whippany at the time. Uh, <clears throat> this is still tragic. We're talking about tragic uh, phase one. I'll just mention uh, the word size is 16-bit serial, and uh, each was stored in a separate electrical delay line, 16 microseconds long. I already showed that. And uh, storage. There were 16, uh, 16 places you could store things, just 16 storage locations. And then the constants were entered using toggle switches, as you saw in the first diagram when Jim Harris is shown with the toggle switches. Uh, the addition and subtraction, 16 microseconds, and multiplication, apparently less than 300 microseconds. And as I said, the clock you had to, the, you needed three, 30 watts was the power uh, that was needed. And uh, this was where the uh, analog thing came in. Uh, you had to convert numbers to voltages <coughs> and vice versa for the oscilloscope too. Okay, all right. <coughs> These are just some stories from the time. Uh, Jim Harris uh, had a lot, had, had wrote several articles having to do with Tradic, and he always had a funny story to tell. So I just picked a few. Uh, and Felker had per pointed out to the Air Force the transistors did not speak loudly, but listen well. Uh, so that power consumed would be far less than in any vacuum tube version. So this was a big selling point. Uh, and so another one was that uh, Felker asked Harris to arrange for a refrigerator with a cooled volume of one cubic foot. Well, you can imagine how, how well that worked out. So I don't know what became of that. And someone else, Harris, uh, tells the story of J.R. Pierce, after whom, who named the transistor, apparently. But he wrote sci-fi articles, and he conjectured that binary technology was invented by an obscure Russian named Ternanov. <laughs> <laughs> Pierce was writing under the pseudonym yes. J.J. Kaufman. Right, he was. Yeah. All right, and Harris also mentioned that they tested it in the large room, which is where I was, uh, and got errors no matter what they did at one point. Uh, and then they finally realized that the errors came whenever a particular rotating antenna uh, pointed at them. So uh, the solution was to build and test in a shielded room. And by the time I came on the scene, there was a shielded room within the bigger laboratory. All right, that's all I really have to say on the first uh, phase one track, which incidentally goes under a lot of other names as well. It had about five other names. But since Felker used phase one uh, the way I spelled it, that's what I used. Uh, here you can see a Boeing, uh, well, uh, an Air Force uh, cargo plane, and in that you see the I don't know how well you can see it, but anyway, the, uh, the, uh, the computer is inside that plane in back of the people that you see. And so that was one of the machines that they built, one that would go in there and we'll, maybe we'll see what size it was. And the second uh, machine was for program development and debugging in the laboratory. I was not in the picture during this time. I was. Uh, my, I think it wasn't done in Whippany, I think it was done somewhere else, uh, but I didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, let's see if we can see here. Uh, the transistors are up, way up, and the, yeah, can you zoom some more? That's, 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 that's it. Okay. <laughs> All right. A lot of it is the same. They used Western electric transistors, different ones. Uh, 
word size was 16 bits as before, and uh, they had this time they had 52 serial delay lines storage slots, so it could do a lot more. And they used uh, for the program not plug boards, but mylar sheets with punched holes. So I think that's probably a little easier to work with. And the times are somewhat similar for the operations. And uh, but the inputs, the inputs and outputs were. Uh, different. That I don't know what shift angle inputs are. Uh, slew and track. Uh, yeah, sort of, uh, you, you can measure an angle and it, it shows the angle <coughs> in a mechanical form and you can read those you can read gadgets. Them. All right. Okay. But they also used um, servos and radar and they had 28 different outputs, so you could output directly to a radar, apparently. Uh, the clock was different. Uh, it, was, uh, it doesn't say the size of the clock, but the power now is 450 watts instead of 30 watts, so it's a lot more powerful. And the size is 39.5 cubic feet, which isn't exactly small, but must have been small enough to get on the... Uh, Thing. Um, power is much higher and uh, calculation times are somewhat different and as are the numbers but anyway this was the second one and if you can go to the next one okay this is leprechaun and on the lower right you see the leprechaun computer which surely is much smaller than uh, than what you saw before, and the people you see with it are, on the left, Jack Giffins, and on the right, Jack Baird. I think Baird was a later a vice president of the labs too, the labs. Uh, if you can s zoom in and we can get rid of the picture, it's okay. I don't know, no, 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 you can't, okay. It's all right. Uh, all right, where did the name Leprechaun come from? It's. Uh, uh, it was. They thought it was a long. Well, if you look, you can see that it was a. Mu it, you, you could do much longer programs. So they wanted. It said long program computer, and they figured out. Well, if you put those string those together, you get long program, which sounds a little bit like leprechaun. And they had some other explanation for why they came up with the name leprechaun, but it stuck because it seemed to be reasonable. And this time, uh, the input was different. Okay, we've got a photoelectric re reader and we've got paper tape. So that's quite a departure from the way it was before. And uh, you had a teletype high-speed punch for output, so you had reasonable output. And, and then you, had a, you could also output to an electric uh, typewriter. So in the previous talk we heard about uh, using a manual typewriter for, uh, but you, here you could actually do this with an electric typewriter. And its size was 15 cubic feet. Uh, and the power is now down somewhat. It's 250 watts. And, uh, okay, we go to the next one. And this is the final XMH3 Tradic. Uh, this was a quite sophisticated design and it was to be built to military specs and used as a control unit of this bombing and navigation system and was to be installed was uh, to be installed in a to be developed high speed tactical bomber effective within a radius of a thousand miles so we're it, I don't believe it was ever built at all. It was certainly never completed as the Air Force canceled the weapon uh, for budgetary reasons. I guess budgetary reasons were always the reason given for canceling something. I think there was some other reason for canceling, but I'm not sure. And I'm looking whether there's anything. Uh, it had about 160 something watts and uh, it weighed Quite a bit. 
bit. I'm just trying to think what the special character. I, I know it had stored memory. Ruth, if you want, I can read it off of the screen. Uh, yeah, I can't read it off my slides because I have six to a page. Uh, let's see, maybe. I'm looking what the. 256 bit words. 18, 18 bit words. 256 yeah. 18 bit words. Yeah. Ferrite core memory. Um, and the uh, flight plan storage was ferrite core memory made non destructible by the placement of permanent magnets near each core that would show a, a one. This type of memory was referred to as a satchel uh, store. Stored in this memory would be up to four flight paths in a flight plan using a maximum of 30 something or other. Fix the name. Fix the name forms. Good, good, good. Yes. Each fixed or aim point required 161 bits. The uh, weight was down to 273 pounds, and if somebody has a calculator, yeah, it's, uh, it's I'd like to know what 10,000... It's six cubic feet. Six cubic feet, feet. Yeah. right. Yeah. I don't we know don't have a weight. it was an inches. <laughs> so it's much smaller. It would have been much smaller. See, the, the, the first strategic was using point contact transistors, which were developed. This was the first patent, I think, in 1947, or perhaps, the patent for the transistor. And this was a very fragile device, which you know, there was a little wire sort of touching to the base. And we have a picture of it also. And so it took several years, I think, in the 1950s, Shockley developed the junction <coughs> transistor, which was a much more stable device you could so the, the, there wasn't that much variability from one transistor to another. So the, the next generation of graphics, and Leprechaun was using the junction transistors, which were not available. Also, they were using silicon junction transistors. It was the first uh, the point contact transistor we used in Germany. Germanium. Later on, they switched. Shockley mentioned so that he didn't uh, want to to sort of develop the junction transistor, still they figured out exactly how the point contact transistor worked. So there was several years gap before the junction transistors using silicon substrates were uh, became practical. Thank you. Yeah, so that's more or less the end. Uh, I just wanted to mention, because I used quite a few references that I could get uh, wherever I could get them, particularly the uh, pa paper by Irvine, Mari Irvine, was very useful. It had all these tables <laughs> that you saw. And um, <clears throat> second one was uh, Jim Harris. Uh, now, Jim Harris. I looked him up at one point to see he's, according to one place, he's 91 years old, but a few weeks ago when I looked, they said he wasn't alive, if anybody knows, uh, because I think I would have contacted him if, if he were alive. And so now that original statement that he died doesn't appear anymore in the place I looked, so I'm not sure. Lyndon Rumson. Uh, but he had a lot to do with the uh, second, the flyable traffic, too. Uh, the next one was Lewis C. Brown, and he was involved in the uh, programming for, I think, for the flyable traffic, probably. And uh, I don't know who else was associated. None of the references mention who was associated with the uh, flyable traffic. And uh, the last one uh, was a paper by Felker, 
which is uh, from which some of the data came. So a lot of the information came from them. And then the early transistor history at Bell Labs, they interviewed Homer Coombs, who was uh, in 2005. These papers are all on the web, but you can't, unless you're a triple IEEE member or uh, belong to some, uh, join some club, you can't get them uh, without, or without paying for them anyway. And I didn't know what they were going to yield, so I I got them through the uh, through other people who were nice enough to get me these papers. Uh, the next slide. And I wanted to thank everybody who provided those technical papers. And uh, there were three that got them for me. Uh, Deborah Charan, who happens to be my daughter. Uh, Mike Veselowitz, is, is he here by any chance? Uh, Evan, Evan Koblenz, of course, who's the producer of this whole show, uh, sent me some papers, and he mentioned to Mike that I was looking for some other papers, so he got those for me, and I appreciate that. And, of course, I'd like to thank all the people here who helped me uh, set up today, and I'd like to also thank my husband uh, for general support and for trying to explain the engineering concepts to its otherwise inclined life, <laughs> as you saw a few minutes ago. And if you want copies, uh, just uh, email me at that address, and that'll be fine. Now, if you have any questions, I'll take questions. I think we're still okay. Uh, yes. What do you remember about the delay line memories? Uh, just... Uh, I think they were using medical delay lines. There would be some kind of transducer at the entrance of the delay line, and now we have like 16 bits. In the, the total time for the delay line goes through was 60 microseconds. And as the clock was one, uh, one megahertz, you could put in 16, 16 bits. Uh, 16 bits would be traveling to this Mercury delay line. And when it comes every time a bit is discovered at the end, it, 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 it's, it's transferred to the beginning. To the end. Yeah, I probably can't remember that much. It was, uh, what was it, 56 years ago. and uh, But most of the people that were associated with the pro project don't seem to be alive anymore. So it makes it a little tough. And there, because it was military contract, a lot of the things were classified. So I don't, I looked through papers and I couldn't find anything from that time period in my closets. And I looked at it. It must be there. Some, I must have taken some of it home, but I couldn't find it. And uh, in fact, I had a picture where you see. Uh, Gene Felker and Jim Harris with the computer. Well, there was a picture published in my alumni magazine that had me at the computer. And I remember I was feeling a little low at the time that, I, you know, maybe I wasn't going where I wanted to go. And uh, then I opened the alumni magazine. No one had said anything to me. And I opened it. And there's this picture, which caused a lot of people, a lot of people saw that picture and asked about it. So I felt a little better about what I had been doing. So it was, an, it, it was a fun job, but I don't think it, was, it lasted that long. I don't recall exactly how long I worked for it. It was two months or six months, probably six months. I okay. guess. There were many references to a sort of comprehensive user's mind, 270 pages. But it was transferred to the Air, to Air Force, probably still somewhere in the Air Force archives. But we could not get hold of it. I'm sure at the time it was classified. It sits somewhere. All the people who wrote the articles that I mentioned had the actual talking to the people who worked on it originally. And they were still alive then. And they had like Harris. They talked to Harris. I don't know about whether they talked to Felker. He was. Uh, but, uh, and other people who worked on the project. So they know more than I do. You yeah. said that the output came on the, the scope. What what did that look like, and then what did you do with it, whatever was, was out there? 
Um, I think it was sent to other locations. In the case of the radar in the Pacific, I think they took the output of the scope and must have sent it to the uh, on site. Did you take pictures of it, or was it like a one and a zero, or what? What physical? No, it was right? an analog output, so you had waveforms. Okay. Yeah. So then you interpreted the waveform and figured out that yeah. it was a zero or a one, and then. Yeah. How many programmers were there? More than you, or no? Were the only I was the only one that I know. I think I was the only one that was doing it because they they were mostly into reliability. They weren't into doing things. But the Felker decided, hey, we needed to show off this machine. We would like to see some something useful being done on it. So I think that's where I came into the picture. And it was a pleasure to have. Uh, you know, other other well-known people uh, worked on the project too, but I don't think anybody else at that time, uh, phase one, was programming. Yeah. How many instructions were available for it? Do you remember? Uh, <coughs> no, I don't remember. I was hoping I could find a program I had written. Uh, as I said, the, the instructions were add, subtract, multiply, divide, and probably some kind of a jump. So I, I would guess a rather small number altogether. But with 128 steps available to you, um, you probably can't deal with too many instructions either. So I don't know anything about the programming language anymore except uh, to speculate. I do remember the problem with the conditional statement being missing. And I consider that a pretty essential statement to have it missing, so uh, but they decided not to do that. And I think an instruction could take more than one step, so if you had, uh, as it was. So. Any more questions? Okay. okay, if not, I thank you for coming.